I realised after I'd lost to him, mentally, I, I wasn't ready to win the world title. I wasn't good enough to win a world title. I kind of found myself in a semi-final against someone, and I, I've apologised to Kirk Shepard after this. Uh, I treated him like an absolute amateur, and I was the I, I acted like the amateur. I know in my heart, I went to bed that night. I was broken. This was the fifth time I'd lost in the semi-final. And it was the fifth time in eight years. Mm. And I'd learned absolutely nothing. <laughs> so we've got a three minute break. So I've decided to pick up the mic and give it, come on, let's have a sing song. And I started to whack out a Tony Christie number. Oh, Las Vegas, the devil gave us to you. <laughs> this guy right at the front, he went, Wayne, concentrate, you're one nil down. <laughs> Anyway, I, honestly, this is what broke John Park. This is what broke John Park, honestly. Now, I don't remember saying it, but apparently I did. So I'm giving it, don't worry, pal. I said, I'll beat him 4-1, he's useless. <laughs> oh, last week, yes, the death. Well, I ended up winning 4-1 tonight. That is what broke John Park. When did you decide that's, that's no more? I remember crying on the way home. And my mum was in the car, so was my dad, and I said, that's it, that's it. I, I've had enough. My love is darts. And if I can give someone a little bit of entertainment whilst watching the darts now, and whilst I was playing, that'd do me. I'm delighted to say that we have a very special guest on the Dart Show podcast this week. It is none other than Wayne Mardell, the five... Mardell. Mar oh, it's a bad start, <laughs> Great isn't Great start, bad Daniel. Start. I'm pretty sure it's Mardell. <laughs> I, I agree. It's, yeah. it's Mardell. Yes. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, Wayne. Um, awesome, you are a former player, a current pundit, a darts icon. Oh, come uh, on well, uh, and a former child BMX enthusiast oh, as well. Uh, not child, still now. still now. Still now. When was the last time you were on a BMX? I would say about, my nephew is 30. I would say about 15 years ago. Okay, so now he's got a loose definition of, of now. Yeah. Still now. <laughs> but yeah but I'm of an age where it was like yesterday. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Um, let's go way back. Um, so, Dagenham. That's where you're from, isn't it? No. Oh. The, That's where you're the, born. This is where this is where Wikipedia just like winds me up. Oh. Uh, I was actually born in in Tottenham. Oh, okay. Which is why I'm a Tottenham fan. But when I was like a month old, we moved. Not through my choice. Right. Uh, we moved to Islington, which is which is the other side of North London. Mm -hmm. And that's where I grew up before I moved to Romford. Okay. And I'm, I consider myself an Essex boy rather than a Londoner. Right. And I'm I'm still residing in Essex. What's but, the difference? Uh, for all of us who. Right, for <laughs> I have no for idea how the know. South works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Essex is kind of east of London, and I live about 70 miles from central London now. Right. Even though I talk right Cockney. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, but yeah, Wikipedia had me down as a Dagnum boy. I, lived, I did live there for about 18 months. Okay, right. So there's some kernel of truth yes, to it. Yes. Right. When did, what, what was early life like? Uh, we lived uh, on a, a council estate that was in Islington, mm. uh, Packington Square, really well known in, in North London. Mm -hmm. uh, quite affluent now. It wasn't when I lived there. It's been gentrified as soon as you left. It's <laughs> the day. <laughs> to the day. Yeah, I was, uh, we left there in 83. Uh, I was born in 73, so we left there just before my, my 10th birthday. Uh, and it was kind of a, a big thing. Moving when you're I had to join another school mm. at the age of like nine or ten, and it, it was it was brutal. It wasn't it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't pleasant. But I, my upbringing was was fantastic. My sister and I uh, we had had a great childhood. It was it was great. See, people all remember you as a player and listen to you as a pundit, and they'll probably assume that you've always been a confident outgoing person. Were you like that as a kid? No, no. I'm not going to go down the I was bullied as a kid, but mm. 
I, I was bullied by a group of girls when I joined this new school. Right. And it absolutely petrified me. And I kind of went into my shell big time. And it, I'm going to say if it wasn't for darts, because I started mingling with... My dad got me into darts. Mm. But if it wasn't for that, I don't think I'd have like started mingling with older people and going to the pub and just coming out of my shell because there was no other outlet for me. And I was the new kid in the school. And before this, before we moved to Rumford, I was like liked mm. by my mates and I left them all behind. Not seen any of them ever since I was about like nine years of age. But yeah, it was, it was just a funny time. But my, my dad... My dad was, uh, when we lived in, in Packington Square in Islington, my dad was like the best kind of uh, influence that I, I ever had. And obviously my, my mum as well. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but he used to kind of take me everywhere. Take me to work, because he, he owned a, uh, a cleaning company mm -hmm. called Donway Cleaning. Donna... Yeah. My sister and Wayne Donway. Nice. This is clever, Dad. <laughs> Dad, this is clever stuff. So he used to take me to work. He used to take me to darts, and it was uh, yeah, it was brilliant. I, I was seeing all all things that, that kids maybe don't don't see. So was are you about eleven when you started playing? Is that right? I was or ten. Ten. I was ten. Yeah. And that becomes quite a big part of your identity from quite early on, then, because Huge. that's your outlet. That's where you can. Yeah, relax and where you feel happiest. Yeah, hundred percent. I'd I'd watched a lot of darts. Like I said, I used to go to the pub with my dad, who was of it was one of the best in the leagues. So when we were in Islington, it was uh, the age of eight or nine, seven, eight, nine. I'd go and watch darts, and I I could tell that he was better than everyone else in the pub. He just looked better. He threw better, and he was he was he was better than them. Mm. So I'm watching someone nearly every day when he was practicing, doing it right. And you learn so quickly at that age. You mimic. And yeah, darts for me was the outlet, uh, apart from BMX riding. Yeah, course. yeah. How good were you at BMX, by the way? Right, uh, yeah, we, we used to have a team uh, that was, it was called R from Rom Skate Park. Right. Uh, Romford Skate Park, but it was actually an orange church. I don't know why it was called Rom Skate Park. Uh, but it was more or less for BMX riding rather than rather than skateboarding or skates anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was very good. I was I didn't race. I was only purely stunts, purely stunts. And my idols back in the day were Bob Harrow and, and Eddie Fiola. For those that know BMX racing, uh, BMX riding, they were the absolute kind of legends and icons. And I actually had the the pleasure of meeting Eddie Fiola, who came to our our, uh, our BMX club, if you will. And uh, I was just showing off, doing a few stunts in front of him. Yeah. And I did his party piece, effectively, in front of him, which is where you cycle as fast as you can. You lay the bike down and you make a straight line skid mark mm -hmm. with your pedal. But it has to be straight. It has to be straight. That sounds quite difficult. It is quite difficult. You've got to keep it straight. The straighter it is, the better it is. But And the longer it goes on for, well... I. I peaked at this moment. I peaked. <laughs> I'm probably now 13 years of age. And and then what you do, when you come, once you come to more or less a standstill, you pick the bike, bike up, you straddle it again, and you ride off. I did this in front of Eddie Fiola, and he just kind of give it, he put his thumb up, and I'm like, oh, I just turned to jelly. It was, it, actually, all what I've achieved in darts, it was still my best moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That is quite in fact. Uh, to be fair, yeah. I ate a 170 in front of Gary Anderson once. Uh, I've never done that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I was going for a 180 and I got very, very scared and shanked it into the bullseye, which led to about half a second of going, oh my God, it's gone horribly wrong, uh, to then a massive celebration. What's a I shank? Think, yeah, I mean, it was good. Wow. It was good. Good for you. I think I still lost the leg. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so you started playing darts. When did you start getting good? Quite quickly? I, this is going to sound uh, very braggy, and I, I, I'm not made that way. I reckon within, and bearing in mind, my dad's there, mm. who I know is a good player. Uh, I reckon within about an hour, he's like, you are good. An hour? You are good at this, yeah. My, and do you, do you my, just watching your dad and yeah. going, that's how you do it, and yeah. so when you actually finally get around to doing it, yeah. 
it's there already. Yeah. I absolutely knew what to do. And my counting, because I'd been watching, I'm going to call it counting. I, I, I didn't see it as counting at the time. I saw it as just patterns. Yeah. And I still do. I still do. I don't, like an 86 finish, I don't know where I pulled that from. I, I don't see it as, as 54, 32. Mm. Even I might say it in commentary at times. I think that's for the viewer. Uh, I see it as that segment leaves that segment. And yeah. if I hit this segment that's not the 54, it's that and that. I just see it as these these little blocks of segments and, and that's it. And that's always kind of stuck with me. But yeah, within about an hour, I think I, I wasn't hitting tons, 140s, 180s, but I was all round the 60, all round it. And I was quite tall as a 10-year-old. I wasn't one of those that needed to jump. Mm -hmm. uh, we see a lot of that on, on kind of social media now where kids are... Uh, need a little boxer stand they up to do, get their yeah, darts I didn't sometimes. need any of that. So... Yeah. I think I started at a good, a good age for me because I wasn't fighting the elements. My dad didn't need to give me a low board and say throw from five foot instead of seven foot nine and a quarter. So yeah, it was it was it was all there. It was all there pretty quickly. So you got you get pretty good pretty quickly, but then there's there's youth tournament. There's, there's stuff going on. Yeah. There's and that involves travel and commitment and yeah. things like that. And that. That was just a no-brainer for you? Was that a difficult thing to actually negotiate? Because obviously you, you folks are working. Y yes. Yeah, my my dad, honestly, uh, by the time we, we moved, because uh, it all kind of happened around 10, 11, 12 age. So moving from Islington to Romford, my dad stopped. Uh, he he uh, dissolved Donway cleaning, uh, become a postman. So he actually had... I'm going to call it a bit bit more time. Mm. Uh, he took me everywhere, absolutely everywhere. I wanted to play youth darts. I wanted. I started playing in leagues with my dad, and they would always put me uh, with him as a, as a pairing in the fours, in the eights. It was great, uh, but it was it was something I wanted to. Do. I wanted to play with with youth players because I wanted to see how good I was, and it was apparent within the first. 10 minutes of me watching the others, look, you're, you're not very good. <laughs> I'm, I'm better than you. And that was like, that was a bit of a light bulb moment that I think that was when I thought about being a darts player. Because that, look, that was still, at that time, you know, darts players were becoming big time celebrities you know it's 84 85 that's, yeah yeah that's when you know Brist Bristol would become like the first supposedly million pound sportsman yes. Yes. in the UK like yeah. it was big yeah but choosing to be a darts player as a profession there's still not many of them i mean what what was the other alternative what was what was mm. going on in school did you have plans or was it just darts well what i kind of remember at the time is that Money was never a thing. I didn't think about money and, and my future. It was, I just wanted to play darts against the best, mm. which meant being a professional. So that was all that, that was all I was thinking of. Mm. I wasn't thinking of making a living out of it. I didn't realise that, obviously what transpired, I'd become a professional darts player. I didn't realise that it was a full-time thing. <laughs> uh, so... All that that then was just like I just want to play someone better than me. Yeah. I never I never felt comfortable, which and I think this is a real big thing. Uh I never felt comfortable turning up and annihilating a lot of these youth players. I got really comfortable playing players that you're you're better than me. I'm I'm gonna try and get you today. Mm. I felt really comfortable with that. And it's funny, because I think that's why I stopped playing because people were better than me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it, it went full full circle. But I, 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 I liked the competition. I loved it. Because, I mean, is it fair to say that at one point you were the best youth player around? I, full stop. On the planet? Yeah. I, I, again, I'm, it's braggy. But yeah. Well, yeah. yeah I, it got to a point where uh, the British teenage was like the, the hardest one to win. And I kind of won that. At a canter, then the British youth that was on TV. This was the biggest thing the world has ever seen in youth darts, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. 
it was a three-day event played on the lakeside stage that was the, the holy grail of stages in darts. Uh, it was in January 1989. So I'm now uh, now 16. I'm a bona fide County A player. I've, I've won events that are like £500 the winner by this point. Uh, I'm winning Opens. I'm winning... I went in Sunday night money in money out tournaments against internationals. I'm I'm doing this. I've turned up at this event and I'm thinking I can't lose this. And I didn't play that well, but I I won it. Mm. And Bristow presenting me the trophy, Eric Bristow presenting me the trophy, uh, was one of those moments that I'm so glad that there's there's photos doing the rounds on on Twitter and all sorts. And I'm so glad that, one, I, rem I remember it. Mm. I remember it. And two, because uh, I don't keep anything. You would not know I'm a darts player if you went into my house. Yeah, it's, no, it's not memorabilia Nothing. or anything like that, is there? Nothing. I think you've got one novelty six-foot dart. Correct. Yeah. In the Cor toilet. Yeah. yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> along, along with a life-size cutout of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're the two. But I'm not a bragger. I'm not an egomaniac. <laughs> uh, that sounds so wrong. Uh, so... This photo of Eric presenting me the, the trophy in the British youth was, I went in there as a the favourite. I was already the holder of the British teenage or I went and won it later. I can't remember whether, but I held the both at once. And it was like, yeah, I, I, I was the best, the best youth player on, on the planet. And I was already so experienced, if you will, because I was playing County A by then. Mm. We've, We've incredible players. We've internationals. We've Kevin Painter was playing for England and Rod Harrington uh, and the other players that you wouldn't know, but that just Essex Essex County icons. Just amazing times. Look, that that's a big deal. Obviously, you've already mentioned it's a massive tournament. It's on the telly as well. Yeah, like playing big stage darts. Everybody knows the persona that you eventually inhabited. Was yeah. that there all along? As soon as you, were you always, did you always class yourself as a showman? Did you always want to go and put on a show? And how, was it natural? Was there a bit of artifice to it? No, it was, it was completely natural, yeah. Uh, my first ever uh, kind of foray into county darts, obviously I used to play youth and you, you get dictated to. You, you wouldn't dare go up and, and say, I want this, this walk on music. So we never really had it mm. in youth. But county was different. So I was uh, 15, 14, 15, when I started playing County Darts for Essex. And you, we all had walk on songs. My first uh, song that I kept for, for the entire, my entire county career was Shout by Lulu. Because I was a great supporter, I love, I love that that team, that team bonding. I love, I love being part of a darts team. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we are winning for for us, like for me. I want to win my point for me, but I also sometimes it got to the point of the point for the team is more important than me, and I, I felt like that. Well, Lulu starts off with the where it's it, and that for me was like, let's go, let's go. <laughs> but what I found myself doing, and I don't know what, bear in mind, Dan, I'm 14, 15 years of age. I'm mixing with absolute darting superstars. As the music played, I found myself jumping up on a chair, orchestrating three, 400 people, giving it, come on, and I'm, I'm giving it, come on, come on now. And as I'm doing it, I'm looking at my mum and dad used to come all the time. Mm. And uh, Donna was there as well, I'm married to her now. We've been together since we were 13 and 14. Nothing's ever changed. We're, we're like this, mm. absolute solid. And I used to look at them and it's like, yeah, yeah. I've, I've got everyone here that I need here. And it was just magnificent times. But that, that show off in me is still there. I, I, oh, yeah, everybody knows. I, I, I do it. I do it as much as I can. But I, I'll tell you what is funny now. I go, everyone do knows, yeah. I go into, like, I do exhibitions with, with MVG Price. I go into my show a little. Really? Um, yeah, I do, yeah. It takes me, like, 
20 minutes, half hour to kind of like, who cares? But I, I do think, yeah, these are the governors now. The, these are the governors, and then I soon come out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soon come out of it, but uh, I'll coax you out. Yeah, it's kind <laughs> of come on. You, you've beat all these, whether it be in an exhibition or, or Michael at a match play, because because I have. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, but yeah, I, it's always been there, even at golf. What what? No, I'm not, I'm not very good at golf. Well, look, I mean, that's that's the demeanour, and that's all all that side of things. The look is another one, and that literally the, the Hawaiian shirts, the nickname, because you were going by the mouth of the South, weren't you originally? Yeah, I is didn't that right? like that. My sponsor named me that at the time. Right. Okay, but it, it was literally a bet, wasn't it? Or was this Wikipedia going mad again? No, no, it it it, it was a bet. Yeah, uh, Peter Manley's uh, one of his best friends at the at the time. Uh, when in we was in Las Vegas mm. in ninety nine, whenever, and. Uh, before that, I was kind of a bit... Oh, I had the showmanship, but I just didn't have the garb to go with it. I was outlandish in personality, but the attire was was very kind of mundane. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so me and, and uh, Dave Ansell was his name. as great guy. He's gone into an, an Hawaiian shirt shop. Specifically uh, Hawaiian it shirt? It was an Hawaiian shirt shop. Fair enough. Every shirt was three ninety nine. <laughs> Dan, these are quality polyester yeah. garments. Come on now, come on now. Anyway, so he's gone in. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll wait out here. Don't worry. I'll go and get a couple of donuts or something. So he's come out with this a wine shirt. I, I just fell in love. I'm like, that is that is just amazing. Have you ever worn a Hawaiian shirt? I've never looked at one. You never seen one? No, I'd seen one. Oh, but, right. but I'd never not in the flesh. I'd never looked at it twice. It yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. oh. And all of a sudden, he's, he's, I'm like, I'm going to buy the same. And I'm going to wear it for the Worlds. I'm going to wear it for the BDO World Championship. You wouldn't do that. I would. I would. And I'm going to wear the red England trousers with it. You wouldn't. I bottled it at the trousers. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Just to let you know that. Because as I've got the shirt on, and this is the other thing. There's, there's, there's kind of... There's aspects to this that they're so comfortable. It was light. It was it was everything you want in an environment where you're going to get hot. Mm. You're going to be stressed. You're gonna you're gonna feel uncomfortable at times just with the situation. So you want to not worry about doing all this. You don't want to worry about doing mm. all that. And I didn't worry about it. It was the most comfortable thing that I'd worn. So I just kept wearing them. And then, obviously, I had my own little range come out in 2003 or whatever it was. <laughs> they sell well? Uh, 6,000 made, sold out within a matter of minutes. Wow. No, it wasn't minutes, but we, yeah, we had we had a great time. Uh, I was sponsored by B&W at the time, uh, based in, in Walthamstow in, in London. And uh, Ron Russ said to me, we've got to get some, uh, we've got to get some Hawaiian shirts made. I said, I, I ain't got no money to lay out for Hawaiian shirts. I was working. But it was in my career was in its infancy, and he went, "We'll go halves, we'll go halves." He said, "I know someone that can make them for about three ninety each." I was like, "Kidding me? <laughs> now these are these are lovely polyester shirts." You don't have to sell them. Sounds to like me, a Wayne. contradiction. <laughs> these are lovely polyester <laughs> shirts. People that have got them will know exactly what I'm on about. They they come out the pack today, today, nigh on twenty years later. Without a crease in. This isn't JVC way. Yeah, I know. Don't, I know. Like, you anyway, know. you could, no. So, uh, we, we we sold them for overnight for 25 quid. I was selling, I, I pulled up at an exhibition. Well, I didn't, Donna did. I didn't drive at the time. Gone to an exhibition. This this guy, in, this is in Doncaster. This guy, I give it, Wayne, your shirts are amazing. You're amazing. There's, there's, there's 43 of them going on some kind of stag weekend. We want, we all want to wear your shirts. 43 of them just like that. I mean, it, it turns out this was a ma- it was a bet, but it was a masterstroke, wasn't it? I, I thank Dave Ensel a lot, but he doesn't know this. I've never given him any credit, <laughs> any credit. But yeah, honestly, it was just it's all uh, you know what I'm like in commentary. It's all about timing, Dan. It was all about timing. Do you ever get any pushback? Like, not, you know, because obviously the persona, the shirts, everything else, 
it, it was it's not the conventional way to play. And I know for years Bristow was very brash and outspoken, and we've always seen these characters in darts. But he's, he's got. I imagine there's plenty of people who haven't been that keen on it. Uh, uh, yeah, and I'll tell you, the, the best two. This is so funny. Uh, at one point, I said, "Look, every player goes through a bit of a lull," mm. and I was kind of. Bearing in mind, and again, not braggy, because this is awful. Uh, at one point, I considered myself the second best player in the world. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't getting the results. I was playing well, but kept losing to Phil Taylor. Just, he, he beat, beat me before we started. Then I started to like not reach the semi-final finals of big events. And the one that said it was because of my shirts and dancing was Peter Manley. <laughs> yeah, you get it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll give it, oh, come on, Pete, do me a favour. Anyway, he was quite quite boring at the time. Mm -hmm. Then he was disliked by the crowd. So to turn it round, he started walking on like a, like a, an absolute... Shirts and dancing, right? Yeah, yeah like an idiot, <laughs> like me, uh, with, a, with a, a pink shirt on. Anyway. Yeah, 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 yes, mate, yeah. Anyway, hey. Ronnie Baxter was another one. Oh, you shouldn't be doing that, shouldn't be doing that. So he comes on to some Queen tune, gives it all this. Anyway, you know, when they're like, I've got nothing, I, I don't listen to them. I don't listen to a word they say. But yeah, I had I, kind of pushed back from, from players, especially when they were waiting for me to, to stop dancing or I was just, it, it relaxed to me. I'm, I'm, I'm not as, uh, my, my brain folk, uh, my brain works in really odd ways. I get very agitated very quickly. I feel angst a lot, and I always have done. And that eased me into the game. I was so kind of like, where I felt for most people it would put them off. For me, it was like, I feel like I'm a little bit more relaxed now, which is the reason I did it. It's the old Peter Wright thing, isn't it? It's Peter the, Wright, the, the most shy... Yeah, yeah would not say boo to a goose. Yeah. wouldn't say anything to a goose. You wouldn't dare say anything to a goose. And They're yet, dangerous. Yeah, they are. They are. They're not as much as swans, but they are that, dangerous. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he, he puts this persona on, the yeah. outfit goes on, the hair yeah. gets done, and he's able to go up there and express himself yeah. on the dartboard. Yeah. I mean, do you, you, you see similarities? When you're watching 100%. Peter come through, you think, that's, that's kind of what I did. Damon Hetz is doing it now. I, yeah. see, I see it from him now. But thinking all the way back then, when I was 14, dancing on the chair in the county stages. It was the same then. It made me feel better. And it's never, ever changed. Even now when I do corporates or exhibitions, I come on, a lot of people just come on and do this. I have to like go from one side of the stage to the other, give it all this. Or if the venues are kind of small enough with like 60, 70, 80, 100 people, I literally high five everyone. <laughs> one, I think it's they've they've spent time, effort, and money to come and see me. Let's give them a, an ounce of my time each, and but they don't know that it it makes me feel better. It calms me down a bit, and I, I don't think I will change. Uh, and you know what what it's like in in commentary where uh, and punditry, uh, you can feel kind of a bit tired beforehand the, the minute we're, we're like ready to go live there's a there's a boost of adrenaline and energy and i sometimes still have to quell it because that's the way that's the way i get i i love darts and i just love sometimes the feeling it brings me right wayne you said that for a, a good period you felt that you were the second best player in the world and second only to the greatest player in history how long do you think that lasted I think it was about two years. And the reason I felt this, I seemed to be getting beaten by him and him only. Mm -hmm. And I was winning a lot of events and I was not winning them, uh, in, in my opinion, when just because I might have been slightly off, it was never my opponent that I felt was ever better than me. Mm. It's like I've lost because I've played... I've underperformed. Not that I don't think you're good enough to actually beat me when I play well. And I think this is important. It makes it about your ability. And I've said this so many times about so many players. Van Gerwen, when he plays well, he believes he's going to win. 
It's nothing to do with the opponent. I had that. And the also, this is the important thing for me, and I've told this to John Park. I had the beating of John Park. And he, he was the world number two. I had the beating of him no matter where we went. And I'm like, I'm better than him. I'm better than him. I'm better. And I worked it all the way down. But I wasn't better than him. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he, I was he all right was, this way. I weren't, I weren't good enough that way. What was it like going up against Phil? I mean, look, so many semi-finals at the World Championship. Yeah. Phil. Yeah. Phil. Well, yeah. Dudbridge was another one, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. But then you finally beat Phil. Yeah. And you've got the man that you think you got the beating of. Yeah. In the final, if you just get past this yeah. unseeded guy, yeah. Kirk Shepard, who nobody expected to even be close. Yeah. What, when you look back on that year, and I know you've spoken about it many times, yeah. that campaign, do you feel that that... You, you don't let that define your darting career, do no. you? No, no. Uh, there's a, a... The public's or the dart, the dart watcher's perception is that that was my chance. Mm. 2006 was my chance. I still think I was the best player in the world in that World Championships. I still do. Even though I've got beat and I didn't win it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that thing, that happens, isn't it? I, I played Phil Taylor in the semi-final and I was the better player. And I remember chatting with Dave Clark on stage after. Phil had gone. He had to prepare for a final, I didn't. Uh, Phil had gone and Dave said, do you mind if we have a word? So I was like, sure. Uh, and I remember saying, at least I now know that I can win a world championship. That's off the back of losing a semi-final. Mm. I did everything but win that game. And it wasn't because I choked, because I bottled it. It was because my timing was just slightly off. I'm, I missed a crucial da a, a double 18 or whatever it was, uh, where I hadn't really missed a, a lot. And whatever he was doing, I had every answer. Every answer. And uh, I think I'd, I'd have gone on and won that year. 2008, I wasn't playing particularly great, uh, but I got the job done against him and against Kirk Shepard. I've said this before. I, do you know what? I realised after I'd lost to him, mentally, I, I wasn't ready to win the world title. I wasn't good enough to win a world title. I was in 2006. 2008, I, I wasn't. What was the difference? I was better in 2006. I was a better player in 2006. And leading up to 2006, I was a way better player than I was in 2008. 2008, uh, for me, I kind of found myself in a semi-final against someone. Mm. And I, I've apologised to Kirk Shepard after this. Uh, I treated him like an absolute amateur. And I, was the, I, I acted like the amateur. Mm. And I've got no worries about saying that. I don't care what people kind of think, say. Uh, I know in my heart, I went to bed that night. I was broken. It was like, Wayne, this is the fifth time. It's not the first, second or third time. Mm. This was the fifth time I'd lost in a semi-final. And it was the fifth time in eight years. Mm. And I'd learn absolutely nothing. <laughs> All I'd learn is that... Uh, Right, I've not got Phil. I've not got an inspired John Walton mm. from back like eight years ago or Mark Dubridge who was just better than me. I've now got someone on an absolute platter and I'm going to annihilate them. And do you know what's the undoing of me? The undoing of me was the first set. And I know this and I knew it as I'm laying my head down that night. Where, where did it go wrong and why did my attitude become that of a of a spoiled brat that's just going to win this game and annihilate John Pike in the final. The first set was three zip. I'm going to say it was like 12, 13, 14 darts. I'll annihilate you, pal. You can't cope with me. You're not good enough. Well, he was good enough and he did cope very well. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just, you've, got, you've got two semi-finals there a couple of years apart and one of them you've lost and you've come off and you're saying, I know, at least I know I can win a, yeah. a world world final, world yeah. title now. And then two years later, you come off and you've lost. Very di did Was that where you thought, I might not ever win one now? There's a story that, that Donna will probably tell you 
better than I will because I don't recall it as much as she does. But apparently, uh, I then turn up for the match play. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm not one of these adults that my wife has to pack for me. I pack my own stuff. Well done. I'm very there, proud of you. There's a lot of them out there, let me tell you, <laughs> the dying world. Uh, and she's like, why have you only packed three shirts? Three dark shirts. I, I don't know. I'd never done that in my life. I'd always packed first round, second, quarter, semi-final. I'd changed. I believed that it wasn't going to happen again. You know what? I was right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, look, before we get to the end of your career, um, John Part is one in particular, because there have there've been loads of highlights. You know, winning things like the Dutch Open, massive yeah. thing, major finals at the match play. Um, obviously all those world runs, various other titles. Yeah. Vegas has a special place yeah. in your heart, doesn't yeah. it? Um, and I am always fascinated to hear how many different ways there are to win a darts match because you certainly employed one of them against John Part in Vegas. <laughs> I, I did, yeah. <laughs> Do tell. Right, let me tell you, he still goes on about it. To oh, I know, time. it's great. Get over it. <laughs> Right, again, I believe this is the, one, the showmanship, and two, the, the stress, the tension that, that builds. So we, a break is called, we go for a break, John goes off, I stay on stage. I pick up uh, John McDonald's mic that is on its little stand on stage. I pick it up, and the crowd, bearing in mind there's a thousand people in the crowd, mm -hmm. But the auditorium probably holds 50,000. <laughs> uh, so it was kind of vacuous. And the, whilst there was a, a nice little crowd there, it was a bit silent. So we've got a three-minute break. So I've decided to pick up the mic and give it, come on, let's have a sing-song. And I started to whack out a Tony Christie number. Oh, Las Vegas, the devil gave us to you. <laughs> well... John, I didn't know backstage, is going to Tommy Cox, this is an utter disgrace, in his, in his kind of uh, Canadian accent. I can't believe what Mardell is doing on my stage. He's an absolute imbecile. What is he doing? Anyway, this guy right at the front, he went, Wayne, concentrate. You're one nil down. Anyway, I, honestly, this is what broke John Part. This is what broke John Part. Honestly, now, I don't remember saying it, but apparently I did. So I'm giving it, don't worry, pal. I said, I'll beat him 4-1. He's useless. <laughs> oh, Las Vegas, the death. Well, I ended up winning 4-1 tonight. That is what broke John Park. Honestly, he still got... I didn't... And You know when I said I had the beating of John Park? Yeah. I was so confident that no, no matter what the position, what the situation, it was that you're not as good as me. You're, you've never been as good as me. But the thing about John Part here is, is slightly better than me. Ace. I think that's been proven, right? I've, I've got no qualms with that. Mm. Uh, but honestly, he, I broke him to the point of, to, do you know what? I'm going to bring it up today. I'll bring it up tonight <laughs> and he will bite like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, when you had to put me off and, and oh, you, you singing as some kind of, I don't even know what it was. Yeah, Honestly. Then make sure I'm there when you do it. Oh. I love watching a John Part implosion. <laughs> um, the end, the end of your career. Now, it's it, uh, illness plays a big part. Yeah. But you, as you said, you know, you were, you're packing to go out in quarterfinals of tournaments. Yeah. You kind of, you can see that the end is coming. You didn't know when it was going to yeah. come. What, what is that experience like? Because it's it's the sport you love, one you've been incredibly successful in, and you can feel that you can't do what you used yeah. to. What What is that experience like? Uh, it's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. And there's a few things that people don't know. Uh, of course, uh, my wife does and, and a few others. Uh, Donna seems to think that mumps ruined me. Mm. Uh, for for best part of five months, I couldn't walk. Uh, as an adult, mumps is just horrific. Uh, she thinks that, and I went from number six to sixteen. So that was that was mid two thousand and nine, mm. I believe. Yeah. So I was. So, so August, so July two thousand and nine. 
uh, sorry, July 2008, I'm, I'm only packing three shirts, but I'm still world number six in, in 2009. I'm, I'm back in the Premier League, by the way. Mm. I'm, I'm still the elite. I didn't feel the elite. I didn't feel it. Anyway, Donna thinks that that ruined all my, my get up and go, my, my guts, my determination, my, my fight. That, and I love to fight on the dartboard. Not physically. I'm, I'm, I'm a costume of a man. I've got no, no <laughs> muscles whatsoever. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, the end uh, was, was coming and it was coming really slowly. And that was the worst thing. Uh, and there's a, a story that I've not really told anyone. I, I feigned illness on a plane. I was, I was getting on a plane to go to Canada for a week-long event. And I got on the plane and feigned illness because I, I couldn't stand it. I'm like, I'm going, I'm going to be away for a week. I'm going to lose. I'm going to sit in an hotel for the next five days. I'm not doing it. It's a lonely place, isn't it, the darts tour? So I, I went home. I went home. Bag got taken off. Everyone was moaning, as in, uh, I'm holding up the plane. I couldn't care less. I just didn't, I didn't want to play anymore. That was 2009 stroke 10. When did you decide that's, that's no more? I lost to GNR Tut in the World Championships. And I remember crying on the way home. And my mum was in the, the car, so was my dad. And I said, that's it, that's it. I, I've had enough. I'd had enough of a few things. I'd had enough of, of the travelling for one but I'd had enough of knowing, and I mean knowing. There's this, there's this uh, you know when I said and, and I didn't think I could win and I was right mm. earlier, I, I knew I couldn't win because I, I was losing games to people that 18 months previously, I'm, I'm absolutely whacking them 6-0. Now I'm losing, not in tight games, they're annihilating me. And whenever a game got tight, I could guarantee I lost it. Whereas before, it's like, you don't want a last leg with me, pal. You don't want a last leg with me. Now it was like, last leg with Mardell. You're kidding me, aren't you? How bad are you playing? So uh, things had, had changed and I, I wanted out. Did I, did, I didn't want to lose anymore. When you make that decision, mm. is it heartbreaking? Is it liberating by that point? Does it actually a weight off your shoulders? Is it both? Question. That's a, yeah, yeah. Uh, can I say all of it? Yeah. Uh, it was financially, uh, I was kind of all right. So I wasn't worried about the imminent future of earning a, a buck. Mm. Uh, but I was thinking of, of me. What, what am I going to, to do to, to satisfy me? Mm. Um, you're, still a, you're still a young man 38. at this point. Yeah. I was 38 when I, when I stopped playing and professional. And darts has been everything. My, my, whole, my whole life. There's no fallback plan. No, no. The, yeah, I mean, you were sensible with your money, weren't you? You yes. pay, paid off your house when you got your first, yeah. or I'd, chunks of it, yes. as much as you could. Yes, I'd, I'd been savvy enough to not have money problems. Mm. But I'm still, still needed to earn dough. Yeah. Uh, so it was a case of, right, what am I going to do? I still had absolute bucket loads of exhibitions. So I was still, like, without sounding like I'm the, the, the best at, at corporate stroke pub exhibitions, I, I know I'm very good because I've seen the others. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wasn't worried about that. So, right, I've got 100 days booked in. I'm I'm good. Mm. I'm good. I've got I've got 70 booked in for the year after. And I've not even started taking bookings yet. I'm all right. Uh, but it's still that I'm not a dart player anymore. I'm so they're going away competing. Oh, this is weird. Then I'm I'm I was lucky that, that I got offered the sky gig when I did. Well that that idea about being had it even crossed your mind being a commentator, pundit presenter or anything i mean because to be honest darts doesn't have a rich history no. of players moving behind the microphone not no. like say cricket or even football or anything like that 
it, it had happened once before, and that was with Rod Harrington. Mm. That literally, that was it. Uh, and I was approached by Dave Clark the year before. So when I lost to Artur, uh, do you want to do something in commentary? I was like, no, I'm, no, no, not not interested. Uh, not not really. I didn't feel at that point. Whilst I knew my career was over, I wasn't ready to actually say on that that particular moment. Uh, no, no, I'm, I, I don't want to do something else yet. So I think it was like a couple of months later where I said I, I wouldn't mind giving it a go and, and Sky gave me a chance at the next year's World Championship. How do you approach it? Because this is new. Look, you yeah. know darts, mm. you know yeah. darts, but this, uh, you know darts and you know showing off. I mean, to be honest, they're two of the main things, but yes. you didn't know that yeah. and it's a lot to learn and you're surrounded by the greats yeah. of darts commentary. Did you feel like the kid at the school again or but the fact of being in that environment for so long and seeing them and knowing them, did it make it easy? I felt under the cosh. I felt under pressure. I felt, I felt out of a comfort zone. Cause I'd, I was like, I'd only ever known one zone. I'd only ever been a player. And I'd, from the age of like 10, I'd always been like that player. And now I'm like gone from being that player. So I've gone into another world. Uh, and Dave Lanning, uh, Sid Waddell and John Gwynn, they couldn't have been better with me. Bearing in mind, I had some kind of relationship with them anyway. Yeah. Because I, they used to commentate on me and I'd see them at hotels and, and all this. So I knew who they were. I knew who they worked. I, I, knew, what their, I knew what their MO was in commentary. Anyway, uh, Rory, Hopkin, uh, Rory Hopkins, who was the uh, exec producer at the time, said, right, sit in with Sid and John for whatever game it was in the World Championship. Just sit there, don't say a word. So I'm like, right, OK. And I'm thinking, come on, Gwynny. And he was kind of, because Sid used to do this. He used to kind of look at the screen, look at his notes, look at the screen, pick out a note that was like 17 years old, <laughs> look at it, read, and all this. And then he would be looking for a note and he'd, he'd do this. So that was... John's turn to speak and John would be kind of looking down at his notes and I'm come on <laughs> hey come on now so straight away I'm thinking I've got you mm -hmm. as in Sid I've got you I've absolutely got you uh, but my first game was with John Gwynn and John was uh, sitting to the, the left I was on the right and his opening gambit was this long monologue uh, about Fleetwood Town Football Club. <laughs> and I've just kind of blurted in, Barney's on the nine data, 180, 180. <laughs> and John's kind of looked up, ho, ho, yeah, ho, ho. And I'm thinking, I've got this. I had the confidence to like, this is wrong. This is wrong, this is right. But John become one of those that... I used to sit there doing finals with him and, and I was lucky enough to get Premier League finals and stuff mm. with John Gwynn and uh, work with Sid on Premier Leagues, uh, which didn't last long enough. Uh, but I'm like, you're so good. Right, what can I pick up that's not copying, but just making it mine? Mm. And whilst I always kind of had this this tone anyway of, ah, as in the, the excitement, the... This is amazing. I'd always kind of had those those ranges, but I'm listening to Gwynny, thinking you're you're a master here, pal. Mm. You you he's indeed. He is indeed. <laughs> yeah. In the 2007 final, you could whisper back then in commentary yeah. because the crowd were not making a racket. Nowadays, that's gone. That's gone. But it he got it, and I, I it's a shame that we know all, all three have passed now, but. I, I was I was lucky. Again, it's timing. I was lucky. If if I'm another if I retire another year later, I don't get to work with Sid Woodell. The approach you've had to darts, how is it different from doing the commentary and presenting side of it, or is it exactly the same? <clears throat> There's it's similar in preparation. You know, we don't just rock up. Some sit, do. Some some do, yeah. 
I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> that reminds me, I'm making John Parr after this. <laughs> anyway, so, no, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm not kidding. Uh, the preparation is key. The You watch more darts than anyone on the planet and you retain all this information. I'm a, I'm a reader of the player and that's kind of my speciality. Uh, these minuscule changes that they make, I can... <laughs> I can walk past the TV and give it... Is, is he doing that instead of... I don't know why I see it. I don't know how I see it. But I, I see it. And I get a real kick out of... This is different. Like Chris Chris Doby. Uh, we're, we're at the match play now. Chris Doby. He's just slightly more measured in this event than he has been in like the, the Premier League. He's got this... Instead of... It's hardly noticeable, but my word, it's making a difference. That is all key of being the commentator I am. Well, the commentary, yes, and the analysis, and, you know, that's something that you've always had in you because you've been a, a technician of the sport, if you like, but you, you're very innovative in that there weren't really darts coaches. And no. You're pretty much a trailblazer in that regard as well, aren't you? Yeah, I, this, this kind of happened... Rod Studd said, because what I was saying in commentary uh, like a decade ago, was like, why do you not do coaching? I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there's a market for it. We, we know what professionals are like. They think they know best. And a lot of them know their, their selves mm -hmm. best. But I was, uh, I was one of the elite. And my wife used to say to me, what are you doing? After I'd played, I may have won, may have lost. What do you mean? What, what, why are you leaning so far forward? What was I? Then I'd watch the game. My word. It's like, it's like, like this. So she had a trained eye on me and me only. Mm. And I'm like, this is incredible. My wife knows more about my throw because she cares by the way mm -hmm. so she's looking as, as uh i don't want to go back to work <laughs> <laughs> she's she's looking because she cares about me winning and losing mm. and it was brilliant information that i was getting from her i'm thinking hold on i'm like kind of world number four or five here how do i not not know my game inside out and when rod stud said he should be doing coaching i decided to give it a go and I realised, and players are now realising, that we all make mistakes. And they're mistakes that, when you're of the elite, they're fixable in a heartbeat mm. because you are so good anyway. They're never, they're never huge, outrageous, outlandish fixes. Or you don't want to throw like that. You want to do that with yeah. this arm. <laughs> it's never that. It's never that. But, yeah, I've... I enjoy it so much, and it will be because it will become the coaching or what I just do. That's well, absolute fact because I I adore it. You, you love the coaching, you love the commentary. Is there? Do you find yourself in the comments box? You might be commentating on a world final. You might be commentating the match play final here this week, and watching the greatest players now mm. playing in the most important games and seeing history being made. But is there always going to be a bit of you that is going, I wish I was still up there? Or is that gone? Honestly, Dan, I, no. I, I mentioned this, this kind of stress and angst that I used to kind of feel. I can watch these guys now and I can feel their anxiety. I can feel the the stresses and strains and pressure they're under. And I can honestly say, with every being of me, if if I had the opportunity, if the PDC just for some reason lost their minds, Wayne playing the Worlds tomorrow, uh, <laughs> December, not for me. I, I, can't hold, I can't hold it together. I wouldn't want to hold it together. That, f that feeling of, oh, yeah, oh, God put me up there. No, it's gone. It's gone. I, I, I think it's because I may be a bit scarred with the end of my career 
not being able to win, maybe, mm. and that feeling of losing, losing, losing. Maybe I've got the feel. Maybe I'm fearful of being beaten again. I think that might be the reason why I don't play in the seniors, you know. I think it come along at a real bad time for me personally anyway. Uh, but I, 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 still, I still get really anxious about things. And showing my wares in an important arena, knowing people knowing that Mardell is trying and failing really gets to me. Me failing in an exhibition, I couldn't care less because I'm there for fun. Mm. I'm there for, for me. As in, they want to see they want to see me. They know I can't match Van Gerwen and, and Price and all those when I play them. Every now and again, I do. Every now and again, over a short enough format. One leg. Uh, <laughs> but no, I don't want that. I don't want to... Maybe I've got a fear of losing and, and maybe show myself up. I don't know. Well... What you have done is made your mark on this game in many different disciplines. That must be incredibly satisfying. It's nice to, to hear that uh, from an absolute connoisseur. Uh, I, I like to think that... Yeah, I like to think that I'll, I'll be remembered as uh, a good darts player, uh, a nice guy and a, and a, and a decent, decent commentator in, in like 30 years. I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not an egomaniac where it's like, oi, 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 I was the best at this, I was the best at that. Look, th I wasn't. But what I, what my love is darts. And if I can give someone a little bit of entertainment whilst watching the darts now and whilst I was playing, that'd do me. You've done it, you've done it for years, Wayne Model. Thank you very much. Thank you, pal. Thanks, mate.